Welcome to the Worship Center in Bryan's Road, Maryland, where Jesus is saving lives, saving souls, and saving futures. Now here's Dr. Steve Davis with wisdom tips, life treats, and gold nuggets from God's Word. Hey, we've been talking about seven ways of dealing with stress and hurt and anger and frustration and how to have patience and all of that from principles out of the 23rd Psalm. And today we're talking about how to deal with hurt and rejection, and a wounded spirit. We all go through those kinds of things. You know, we've been just dealing with these seven approaches to dealing with stress, seven principles that are found in the 23rd Psalm, and this is a big one today. How to deal with rejection, how to deal with mean people, how to deal with heartache, a wounded spirit. Nobody escapes these. You know, even Jesus had to deal with that when he was walking on the earth. So how much more are we going to have to deal with it? We live in a very aggressive and hard-hearted world, and there are so many ways we can get hurt, and we can be hurt physically by accidents and disease. We can be hurt emotionally by other people and relationships that can bring the greatest joy in our lives, but at the same time, they can bring the greatest pain in our lives. People hurt us sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes accidentally, and sometimes on purpose. Psalm 23 verse 5 says, talking to God. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Psalm 23 verse 5. You know, one of the toughest things that we all face is how do we handle it when people come against us or they're rude or they betray us? I don't think anybody just naturally deals with it really well. I know I don't. We develop ways that seem to work for us. Some people seem to deal with it super well, and others seem to fall apart, overreact. And today we're going to talk about five ways of dealing with hurt that turn out to be ineffective and sometimes make things worse. Then we'll talk about the upside of it all. You know, a lot of us were raised to just ignore it when somebody hurt our feelings. My dad was a Marine, and from there, after he left the Marine Corps, he joined the state police. So he did not have a touchy-feely way of dealing with pain. He would tell me and my sister, hey, consider the source. He'd say, ah, they're just doing it to get attention or to get a reaction out of you. So just do your best to ignore it. You know, don't give them the pleasure of knowing that they hurt your feelings. You know, that was his kind of number one way, you know. So somebody would do something that hurt my feelings or hurt her feelings, and we'd try to ignore it. And you say, ah, it didn't hurt. We'd pretend we weren't mad that it, it didn't break our hearts, you know, or he would say, hey, just deal with it later. You know, sometimes we just would play it down and minimize it and tell ourselves, hey, it's no big deal. It didn't really hurt that bad. It could have been worse. And, you know, socially or in a group of people, that's not really too bad of an approach, you know, if you can shrug it off. But ultimately, you need to deal with it. Otherwise, it can be something that we fume over and fuss over and build it up inside. And that little insult can turn into a pent-up rage if we don't deal with our feelings ultimately. You know, David used that approach. It didn't work with him very long. It didn't work too good. Psalm 39 and verse 2, he said, I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good. And my sorrow was stirred up. Psalm 39 verse 2, he's like, hey, I didn't say anything. Not even good stuff. I just was quiet. I wasn't talking to anybody. I had nothing to say to anyone. And I found out it made it worse. So, Number one bad approach, ignoring it. A second approach some people do is avoid it. Just take off, run from it, escape, be gone, get in the car and drive off if you have access to a car. A lot of people do that. They get hurt, they get their things, and they leave. And you see that a lot in churches. A person gets hurt and they may quietly leave and maybe never come back. You call them and say, hey, what's wrong? And they might say, oh, nothing, I'm fine, I'm fine. But actually something's very wrong, but they don't want to conf run it. They don't want to be confrontational. They don't want to talk about it. They just pull back. And a lot of people who are nice do this one. David wanted to do this. He talked about it in Psalm 55, verses 6, 7, and 8. He said, if only I had wings like a dove, I'd fly away and find rest. How far away I would flee. I would stay out in the wilderness. I'd hurry to my shelter from the raging wind and the storm. I just want to leave. I just want to disappear. I want to get away from all the tension and frustration and static in the air. But the problem with this is is that the problem or that hurt never gets dealt with. It never gets resolved. And we can end up with a lot of avoidance in our lives. Avoiding other people, avoiding churches where we used to go to and we got our feelings hurt. Avoiding groups of people that 
We felt maybe they didn't support us. We embarrassed ourselves in front of them. Another way that's pretty common among Christians, especially, is this one. Just cover it up. Hide it. Pretend everything is fine. Be smiley, laughing and pleasant and sociable and all that while we're dying inside. Yeah, we don't want to be a bring down. We don't want to look like we don't have the victory. So we act like everything is fine and we're praising the Lord and figure that's better than letting people know that our feelings are hurt or that we're upset. But you know what? I thank God that he's near and he saves people who are crushed in their spirit. Psalm 34 verse 18 says that. Psalm 147 verse 3 says that he heals the broken heart and he binds up our wounds. So we can be real and we should be able to keep it real around our circle of people that we worship with or that we're close with. I mean, everybody's got a hurt, a pain, a disappointment. It's not more spiritual to pretend that you're not hurt when you really are. Share your hurt with a person or some people you trust. That's the beginning for healing your hurt. It's the beginning for healing your pain. It's okay to let people know that sometimes things do hurt your feelings and that you're human. A fourth way that a lot of people deal with the hurts and disappointments is to worry about the whole situation over and over and over again, going it over, going over it in your mind and in your spirit, being afraid to care about anybody else again. I'm never going to trust a church again. I'm never going to get close to anybody again. I might get hurt. But you know what? That's part of our growing process. Sometimes people do break our trust. Sometimes people do take advantage of our trusting nature or our generosity. Sometimes people do repeat something we told them in confidence. But guess what? We can't change what's already happened. Replaying the situation and reliving that pain over and over and over again doesn't help us one bit or anybody else. Philippians Chapter 4, verse 8 is a good one for this. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And then Paul says, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, put it in practice. He says, and then the God of peace will be with you. That peace of God will be with you. And instead of going over and over the pain and the hurt and the injustices and the heartache, instead find what's good. Is there something right, something lovely, something pure, something fair, that's something admirable, and go over those things over and over in your mind. That's what the Word of God says. And if you do this, heaven's peace will be upon you. And I can tell you this, worry never solves your problems. It never heals your hurts. The more you worry about something, the more powerful it seems. And here is a dangerous way to deal with those hurts and those rejections and those betrayals. And here's one that a lot of people do, the fifth one. And it's not good for them. It's not good for anybody else. And that's this, to get bitter about it. Bitterness never makes you better. You know, deciding, I hate all men or hate all women or hate all churches or whatever else it is. You know, I just hate them all. They're all lousy. And it's easy when we get hurt to become bitter. But bitterness hurts you more than it hurts the person you're bitter against. Bitterness is self-destruction and it's a poison. Ephesians 4 verse 31 says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you, along with all malice. You know, bitterness may come. He said, but you better put it away. Put that away, along with your anger and bad-mouthing people and wishing bad things for them. That's Ephesians 4, verse 31 says that. So, in Psalm 23, verse 5, David's talking up to God about people who are contrary to him. And the very first right way of dealing with hurt, rejection, betrayal, and all that, number one, talk to God about it. David said there in verse 5, talking to God, he said, You prepare before me in the presence of mine enemy. You prepare a table before me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Now, if you've ever been deployed in the military, you'll know that you can pretty well judge how close to the enemy lines you are by the eating arrangements, how they are. If you're eating MREs outside, standing up or squatting while you're eating and scanning the sky and looking around for enemy activity, you're on the front lines. If there's a mess tent, you're back a bit from the threat. But if you're in a brick and mortar mess hall with heat or air conditioning and great tables in there and all of that and a cafeteria and all, you're in a pretty secure situation. So David, who is an experienced soldier, tells us how it is with God. He says, our God prepares us a table in the presence of his enemies. He said, I'm on the front lines, but I'm safe and secure 
eating at the table of my God. I mean, that's a blessing. So instead of being dirty and sweaty and grimy, he says, man, I'm cleaned up. I'm looking ready. I'm there sitting at the table of the Lord. You anoint my head with oil. You cleanse me. You are my cleansing. You're my safety. You're my provider. My cup runs over. Man, I'm not there just making little sips out of my canteen because I don't have enough water. I'm not on my knees scooping a little water out of a stream. Nope, I got a cup. I'm cleansed. I'm feasting at the table of the Lord, and there's more than enough. I'm at the Lord's table as his dinner guest, and my cup runs over. Part of having faith in God is receiving that healing, that anointing, that provision and protection from God. David said in Psalm 147 and verse 3 that God heals the broken heart and binds up the wounds. He brings us his healing for our wounded and broken spirits. He heals the broken hearted and you can count on him for that. You can come to God's table. Let him anoint your head with oil. Drink from his cup that overflows. Oh, have you ever been to somebody's house for a visit? And you're wondering, you know, when you should leave, when should I go, am I staying too long? You know, in the Middle East, they have a custom. The host will keep on filling the cup of the guest as long as they're welcome. But when it gets late and the host wants to go to bed, they stop filling the cup. That's the sign. It's time to go. But guess what? God never stops filling your cup. You're always present, always welcome at his house and in his presence. He says, you know, I prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. God says, I'll anoint your head with oil. Your cup will always be overflowing. I mean, that blesses me to always be present with God. And I hope it blesses you. And I hope you'll share this message with someone who could use some encouragement today. And remember to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to be part of our Worship Center extended family if you haven't already. Oh, and as always, please pray for me. I totally value that and know that I pray for you. We hope you were blessed, inspired, and challenged by what you heard today. And we pray that God spoke some inspired truths into your heart. This ministry is supported by your gifts and donations. If you'd like to help us spread the good news, you can give at our website, www.theworshipcenter.org. Or you can text to give at 301-637-0777. It's easy and takes only seconds to set up. Thank you for listening and God bless you and your family.